Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 14 of Out of Character, a show where your favorite creators drop out of character for an hour to talk with game designer and host Mark Tassin, that'd be me, about their art, their process, and all the nerdy stuff that inspires them. From the secrets behind the craft, to the ins and outs of the business, to the games, shows, and books that they can't get enough of, it's a unique and candid look at the people who create the stuff you and I love. Comments are going to be open throughout the show here, so just keep in mind that if you have something you want to say or a question you want to ask, feel free to drop that in. We'll try to pull that in if we can. Um, and with that, enough preamble. Allow me to introduce Out of Character's guest this week. I'm very excited to welcome Kristen Britton. Hello. Hi, how are you? I'm great. How about you? Not too bad. That's good. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. Totally my pleasure. So for folks who may not know your name right offhand, which I think most people who are watching probably do, but on the off chance that someone doesn't, tell us a little bit about what you've done, what your what sort of work you've done. Uh, well, most people who know me would know me that from the Green Rider series, which is an epic fantasy series of novels, uh, which first came out, the first book came out in 1998. Mm -hmm. and is still going strong. At least I hope it's strong. <laughs> That's awesome. And you have uh, a release, of, I think it's a paperback of the of Winterlight coming up. That's soon. right. Uh, Winterlight came out in hardcover, and now it's about to come out in paperback in August. August okay. 23rd, I believe, is the date. Ah, very cool. So how many books total in the series now? Um, uh, let's see. There are seven novels. I'm working on number eight, and then there's a collection of uh, shorter stories and a novella. Oh, very cool. So let me ask, a lot of authors, they tend to do one or the other. They're like, I'm going to write short fiction because I love writing short fiction. I could tell a tight story, or I'm going to write uh, long fiction. I'm going to write novels because I can't imagine trying to squeeze it all into one. You're doing both. How is it that you do both? Do you, do you find both just as challenging or easy as the other? <laughs> Short fiction is way harder <laughs> uh -huh. because I'm I'm my first love is long fiction, yeah, and uh, that comes from having read you know the Lord of the Rings multiple times and uh -huh. <laughs> and going being dragged into the the fantasy genre that way. Um, but short stories are, they're much harder. It took me a while to understand how they work and so forth. And I really haven't had, compared to some people, that many published. But it's, mm -hmm. it does offer an opportunity to explore different worlds and, and themes and stories than um, the ongoing Green Rider series. Okay. And the short fiction that goes with the world it, it, you were saying it allows you to explore themes and stories you know i know some authors who are like yeah i do this short story because i've always wanted to tell this little piece but it doesn't fit anywhere else within the novel series but i mean so it sounds like that's what you're getting a chance to do with some of these shorts yeah it's like a it's like a little vacation uh-huh <laughs> i mean i love writing the novels i lo absolutely love them and um, love the characters and so forth but sometimes you know you've got to do something different with your creative create creative mind that's awesome and your publisher uh supports this breaking away from the novels to you don't have any trouble getting them to okay your uh divergences off to the to the side uh they're they're, they're not really involved in that that's you know it's something i do on the side um yeah, with the great. exception of the collection which they published well, I know that not everybody has that luxury, right? Because, I mean, the business of writing is sometimes they have a tighter control over what you can or can't publish outside of what they're doing. So it sounds like that, at least for you, there's opportunities for you to sort of explore things away from them without having to involve them all the time. Is that true? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So most of the anthologies I've been in are um, with various editors. Some have been anthologies that were published by my novel publisher yeah. um, but they're they're independent of what I'm doing with my novels got it so let me ask you mentioned you made the mistake of mentioning Lord of the Rings so now I want to ask about Lord of the Rings <laughs> when did you first discover Lord of the Rings well I was aware of it um, 
It's probably in my single digits. Uh, my sister in the 70s was into The Lord of the Rings. Mm -hmm. And she tried to get me to read The Hobbit, and I didn't really take to it. My reading was mostly like horse books. Yeah. I was really into horse books. Um, I was really into horses. But then when I was a little bit older, maybe 12 or 13, um, I made a friend at the stable where I rode, and she was really into The Lord of the Rings and insisted that I re read it, and mm -hmm. I did, and I kept rereading it. Um, I don't know how many times I read it when I was that young. That's awesome. Yeah. And what is it about The Lord of the Rings that was so captivating for you? What was it that drew you into it so much? I think it was um, being put in a different place. It was just totally being drawn into the atmosphere. Like I could, I could take, taste the, the mushrooms at Farmer Maggot's place, you know? Right. And um, yeah, it just sort of grabbed my imagination. Yeah. The portal to another world sort of thing yep. that it gives you. Oh, cool. You know, one of the things though, that I do know is that when you first read books like that, you you have one take on them. But as you become, say, a writer yourself, you start to look at them in a slightly different way. You're getting different things out of them. Are there different things that you've pulled from Lord of the Rings? Or do you keep that sort of in your just enjoyment, don't think craft when you read them type of a, a thing? Or do you, do you take things from the now where you're like going, that, I, I love how he was able to do that with his writing. It's really interesting. I um, started rereading Fellowship. Uh, I think it's like last year or the year before. And this time I noticed how many directions Tolkien <laughs> gives to <laughs> where the characters are going. And I thought I never picked up on that, but I started paying attention to that. And I thought, wow. And it must be that I was so enraptured with the setting and all that that it didn't matter where the characters were going or how they were yeah. going there, but it was the sound of the prose that carried mm -hmm. me along and what was going on in my imagination. Yeah. It's funny because sometimes the things that if, if you were in a writing class and you said, well, I want to, if you're to, in an audience and say, well, I'm going to write all the directions on how they get to the places, how far it is and which roads they take. Everyone would be like, going, uh, you don't want to go into that much detail, right? That's, that's going to yeah. sort of distract the reader. But the truth is, is that it's, I find it fascinating that rules only, you can break rules if you do it well. <laughs> at the end of the day, right? Is that rules? Yes. It doesn't matter what rule you break. I mean, it sounds like you agree that that tends to be the case. Yeah, I think, you know, rules are made to be broken, but they're meant to be broken um, appropriately <laughs> yeah. and, and done well. Yeah, elegant breakage. <laughs> yes, that's a good way to put it. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I think that that's especially challenging. There are so many, you know, we talk about tropes fair amount have on previous conversations here, tropes or cliches that, you know, with fantasy, especially in epic fantasy, even more, it's sort of like just so laced through with these sort of underlying tropes and ideas. And I don't mean this in a negative way. I mean, trope is in, we understand it's sort of like a shared fantasy language. You know, how do you take those things and how do you work your way through those so you're doing them well? So you're capturing those ideas well in an epic fantasy story without it being sort of like, oh, you know, some people I think use them as a crutch, for example, or use them as a, you know, stand in for coming up with something creative. Like, how do you use them artistically? If I use them, it's to have fun with them. Uh huh. Uh, so, um, someone recently in a comment on one of my social media accounts, brought mm -hmm. up the trope of the of the ball um of going to a ball basically. oh right right yeah and so you know the fun is taking it and making it your own and having for me having fun with it um like putting my character in a totally inappropriate costume and <laughs> that kind of thing so bringing yeah. it all to life and then messing with it in in ways that <laughs> Yeah, well, that's, you know, I think that's what most authors like to do is mess with their characters and the uh -huh. tropes and the story and and their readers. 
So. so if for folks who haven't read your Green Rider series, tell us a little bit about what it's what it's about. What is the premise of the of the story? Uh, OK, uh, Green Riders are royal messengers of the king. And the story begins in Green Rider with a runaway schoolgirl who encounters a dying messenger along the road. Mm -hmm. And he begs her to carry on his message that is life or death and very important to the king. And she agrees to do this, and in so doing, becomes a green rider herself and gets into plenty of trouble along the way. And so we continue to follow her arc and the overall story arc um, into what I'm working on now, which is book eight. Now, is book eight your conclusion or is are, do you have more books in mind if you can tell this you know if you if you don't mind sharing i don't want you to get yourself in trouble by saying well you told us there'd be a book nine you know type of thing <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah i'm hoping that i'm able to bring the current arc to conclusion book eight mm -hmm. after that i'm under contract for four more books three of which are going to be in the world of green rider mm -hmm. and one of which is supposed to be an author's choice Ooh, cool yeah, so we shall see. Yeah. Well, I'm sure that knowing that you're under contract for more books probably just made everyone listening super happy. Um, all your parents, <laughs> so, like, ooh, good. Um, you know, when you got your first book published, was it the Green Rider, uh, the first Green Rider book that you published first? Yes. And when you, how did that happen? What, how did that come about? Um, like most writers, um, the story of becoming a writer begins pretty early. Mm -hmm. And mine began after reading Tolkien so many times. I was like, I really love this, but the characters are doing the same thing over and over. And mm -hmm. so I decided I better start writing my own stories. And like a lot of other writers, I wrote, you know, my first novels when I was a teenager mm -hmm. and had a dream of one day being a published author. And uh, then I went on to college and, you know, I was still writing. I had a minor in writing when I was in college. And, um, but then after college, I had to do something with my life and earn money. And so I went into <laughs> right. the National Park Service, but I kept writing. And in 1992, I was spending my first uh, winter at Acadia National Park. I was working part time. And so the rest of the time I decided to sit down and try to write a novel like I had when I was in high school, when I was a teenager. Mm -hmm. um, I tried short stories, they weren't working out for me, so I decided to go to my first love, which was novel writing. And so I got first draft over the course of a year, and over the next four years was rewriting, revising, um, and sending out and getting rejections, that kind of thing. But finally, in 96, I got an agent, and we sold to Daw Books, and the first book came out in 1998. Well, that's fantastic. And so, I mean, basically, you did it the classic way of just packaging it up and sending it off and hoping that you could get someone to bite on what you'd written, it sounds like. Yep, and literally packaging it because we didn't yeah. have much internet back in those days. <laughs> right, back in the days before the internet, before Atlantis sank into the sea and you used to have to use paper to send That's things right. to people. <laughs> 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 oh, man. So that's. I think it's great because... It is. It really is a good example of how long this process can be, right? A lot of people, they write and write and they're like, is, it, is anything ever going to happen for me? And even if something does happen, a lot of folks, you know, it doesn't happen. But for those that do, it can still take years before it all finally comes together. I mean, were you already working on the next books before you got the first one bought? Or did you just hold off till you got that first one done? I uh, I was just focused on that first book, and I wasn't going to assume that even if somebody wanted to publish my first book, that they yeah. would want a second book. <laughs> Turns out they did. <laughs> yeah, well, it's good though, right? But yeah. now, how long did you have to write the second one? Um, the second book is kind of a, a long story. Um, there's five years between the first book and the second book. Mm -hmm. And that's because I had to completely rewrite the manuscript um, after having 
written the first one in a year. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there was some turmoil there. But um, eventually we got it out and it turned out pretty well. Well, yeah, apparently they've asked for a whole bunch more so over the years. So clearly they were very happy with the outcome. I just always think that it must be really hard to have the first book come out, have people like it. And they're like, okay, do that again. Yes. <laughs> It's a lot of pressure. You know, the first book, you don't have an editor, you don't have an audience, Mm -hmm. um, you don't have anybody waiting on you, and you are exploring the craft, and I had a lot of fun writing that first draft, Mm -hmm. Um, but then the second book comes along, and I'm sure I'm not alone. In fact, I know I'm not alone in having what's what's called second Mm book-itis, and... um, having all those people waiting on you. So does it ever get any easier or does it always feel that way every time the next book comes along? It feels like a big mountain to climb, um, Mm -hmm. pushing up that, you know, like Sisyphus pushing up that rock. But um, I have a better grasp these days of how story works and and, um, you don't really learn how to write a novel. You have to do it by experience, I believe. Yeah. And finally, I guess, after writing so many books, a certain amount, I'm finally getting it. Now, when you went to write your first book, were you writing a book that you thought would sell, or were you just writing the book that you loved? Uh, it was both taking on a challenge. I thought this would be an interesting challenge to see if I could get this published, but it was also, you know, something I loved. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just wondered because it's, we've heard, we've talked to a lot of different people, you know, artists and writers and podcasters and everything else. And one of the things that keeps coming up is in the end, the thing that seems to work for them is all, pretty much always the thing that just they love doing. There's no like magic formula or the right book for the industry or something like that. It seems like for the most part, the ones that are successful and the ones that actually help them to, to make it, you know, with quotes, make it are the thing that they just really cared about the most and didn't try to follow the right rules of the business or something. Did you, is, was that true for you or did you, because yep. you yeah, talked about I, rewriting and yeah. And I think it's wise to choose something that you love because if you're going to be rewriting and revising and you hate it, that's going to transmit subconsciously or otherwise to the reader and your book will not maybe succeed. (laughs) And if you hated it, if you didn't like it to start with, you're definitely not going to like it by the time you're done. And heaven forbid you actually do get it published and they want you to do another one after that. So yeah. So (laughs) nobody needs to put themselves through that. (laughs) Right. Exactly. Heaven forbid you get published, but you know what I mean? Um, so (laughs) one of the things I thought was super cool, I want to bring this up because I love music and this was really cool to me is tell me about this, the green rider soundtrack. Yeah. Yeah, this is really cool. Back in 2017, uh, Composer Christina Bischoff approached my agent and I about wanting to do um, uh, music for mm-hmm. um, the book, and like a soundtrack, a book soundtrack. And my agent and I were kind of like, well, we've never heard of this before. Mm-hmm. And it looked interesting. And, you know, she had credentials and, and that sort of thing. So we thought, okay, we'll, we'll go with this. And the way that she funded it was through Kickstarter. And she did so in conjunction with the person who created the art for the cover of the CD, uh, Madeline Shane. And Madeline ended up with a lot of photos. And so she ended up in conjunction with the soundtrack, putting out a book of photos um, that were all Green Rider. Mm -hmm. So, um, we have this wonderful soundtrack and even if you're not into green rider the book if you like soundtracks or you know just music in general it's a great listen and the second book has a soundtrack as well that's coming out soon oh, both by christina cool. and madeline so yeah oh that's awesome yeah because i mean it's not something you see very often like you said it's a completely different sort of take but i love the idea that 
in today's world, we can mix medias that way. You know, we're not just limited to the one thing that through the internet and through being able to, to uh, distribute digitally, it opens up these possibilities in ways where it might've been harder to do if you had to just press the CD and get it into stores and things like who's going to sell at the bookstore, the CD store, how are they going to market it? You know, that yeah. sort of thing. Well, what, what is so cool for me is that um, music is a, is generally a great inspiration for me, mm -hmm. but I never th thought of my books inspiring music. So it's like this complete circle that. that oh yeah. 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 So what sort of music do you listen to? What what is your get get me in the writing mood for Green Rider music? Uh, a lot of it is um, instrumental, like what they used to call New Age. I uh -huh. do you listen the vocals I will listen to are like Enya. And mm -hmm. I listen to a lot of Enya. Um, I feel like she's like a I don't know, a Elvish singer somewhere out there right, in the exactly. woods. She's like so <laughs> fey, is the whole yeah. thing, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, with that voice and, and what she does with it. Um, mm -hmm. And, of course, now I have the soundtracks to listen to as mm -hmm. well when I'm writing. But Yes, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> yep. Yep. So I have, I have a ton of um, old Wyndham Hill and Narada music CDs and mm -hmm. um, various other things. And then a strange piece will come to me and inspire a scene maybe like um, – Pink Floyd inspired a scene for Winterlight or helped, mm -hmm. you know, generate the imagery for it. Yeah. No, oh, that's awesome. Um, you know, so one thing I want to ask about is that I can sort of see out your window a little bit. You live in like the ultimate stereotype of the writer's life. You have a log cabin in the woods where you do your writing from. Is that, do I have that right, basically? <laughs> well, when when I first started publishing, I did ha I did live in a stereotypical cabin in the woods. Okay, uh, <laughs> not the scary kind, the f place where writers want to be, not the cabin in the woods, <laughs> Sam Raimi style. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah, and so I I lived there for I think about twelve years, and then I decided to try New Mexico for a while and was out there in an adobe house out in the desert. Uh -huh. And th then I came back to Maine, and so now I'm kind of in a, a cottage in, a, in the woods again. Uh huh. So, so you know, nature's. You, I've talked to you a little bit before this, but nature's a huge inspiration for you. You know, how does it shape your writing? How does the nature that you experienced both when you were a park ranger and now where you're living, you know, how does that find its way into your books? Is it more of a, just a general inspiration? Is it a very direct inspiration? Uh, it inspires me in a few different ways. Um, a lot of times if I'm walking, I will generate story ideas. So walking out in nature is, is very good for that. And then um, I worked at Acadia National Park, on, which is on the island where I live. And so I was out in the park, and um, one of my jobs for a while was to um, ride on our historic carriage roads a bicycle to do sort of courtesy patrols. Mm -hmm. And so I'm on the shoulders of mountains and through the woods and by the ponds and lakes and, and this and that. And so it sort of um, fed into the whole Green Rider idea of someone mm -hmm. riding horseback through the woods. And then specifically, uh, I draw on aspects of the nature around me to help with the setting. Mm -hmm. So like, uh, you know, there's tongue lichen or whatever it's, it was that um, I used in the first book or mm -hmm. the spruce fir forest or the types of mosses and stuff. So it helps helps me give a third dimension to the writing. Hmm, very cool. Now, are you still a ranger? Nope. Um, I left the park service in 2003 to okay. pursue writing full time. Oh, awesome. Yeah. At the time when I was at the time there towards the end, um, I was the writer editor for Acadia National Park. And so mm -hmm. I would, go to my day job and be in front of a computer doing writer editor stuff all day. Right. Then I would come home, have a quick supper and then be on the computer until 10 or 11 <laughs> at night, you know, doing that. And it became very hard. It was like dueling careers. 
Right. So. Well, I mean, but I mean, you did that for quite a few years. It sounds like after the first book came out to the to 2003, there was a decent number of years where you were doing both before you finally took the plunge to just do the writing full time. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, writing is not the most secure career <laughs> to have. And so I went to, when I made that leap, I went to feel like I could do it somewhat securely. Yeah. Was it terrifying all the same? Um, I don't remember terrifying. It was kind of a relief. Um, yeah. And it was also a little bit sorrowful because I had been, you know, doing it for so long. And, you know, people who work in parks can be a tight-knit group and that, and that kind of thing. It was yeah. strange to be separate from that. Well, yeah. I mean, even working as you did in the wilderness, so to speak, you weren't completely alone. It's kind of a very different lifestyle, I imagine, now being just the author in your house. Do you get much opportunity where you're at to run into a lot of other people or not? I tend to hang out in my cave. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm extremely introverted, and so I, I uh, don't get out very often. And of course, the whole COVID thing kind of put the gabosh on a lot of socializing uh, in person anyway. But I try to get out now and then and 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 not just be a you know person who hides in a cave. So. Total hermit, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I gotta say that for a lot of us, you know, COVID very much was like, Well, you want me to stay home by myself all day? Okay, I'm good with that. I can pull that off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. State, so not a problem. Excellent. Same, same here, yeah. So as far as, you know, inspiration, it sounds like for the most part, nature is your inspiration. Lord of the Rings. Were there other authors or books that sort of really captured your imagination over the years? Or was it was that really the main one that drove you? That was initially the main one. I was also a big fan of Anne McCaffrey's mm. Dragon Riders of Pern. And um, Lloyd Alexander, uh, who yes. wrote The Book of Three and Black Cauldron, and uh, the other books that go with that. Um, I like to name those because they're kind of the ones that hit me at that that age when it's very impressionable. And um, they're just sort of classics as well. Yeah. All my Lloyd Alexander books are right up here. Ah. Uh, Prudane uh, Almanac, or I forget what it's called, but it's the gazetteer that has all the details about it pulled from all the books. But I love those books. And I think what's amazing to me about them, and I've reread them fairly recently, in fact, is that they have a very different feel than most fantasy stories. The, the fighting isn't the important part, right? And in a lot of ways... They sort of, they sort of like almost say like, you really don't want to fight. You don't want to get into this battle. And I just find that to be such a fascinating departure from what you see in almost every other type of fantasy book. I don't know if you get that at all from them. It's been a while since I've read them, but yeah. I think that one of the things that I really got from them is the gentle humor that's in yeah. them. Yeah. And, um, so define think, gentle humor. What what's gentle humor to you? It's where you're not like ha 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 ha, <laughs> you know, at at some yeah. joke. Um, it's just something that's amusing. Um, I'm trying to think of an example, but nothing because I haven't read the books in so long. Yeah. But maybe you know something like um, there's a big cat. I remember that oh, they ride. Oh yeah. Yep. Yeah, and. And that's that's kind of a gentle humor. Mm -hmm. um, so as opposed to being, it's sort of, it, would you say that gentle humor is humor that it, it sort of erupts, uh, comes naturally from the situation and the setting as opposed to directed at someone to try to, you know, take humor from someone else or laugh, oh, not yeah, laugh. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's, a good way to put it. Yeah. Love, love Lloyd Alexander. I just talk about Lloyd Alexander books all day. Plus I love yeah. all of his other books as well. He, uh, amazing books. Out of curiosity, did you ever read Zilpha Keatley Snyder? No. Okay. Uh, I won't go into those today, but yeah, that's another <laughs> series that same time as, as the, the book of three and Terran Wanderer and all of those. 
as Lloyd Alexander's books were coming out, those were coming out as well. A little bit more into sci-fi and looking at a uh, potentially utopian society and the potentially uh, the dangers of that, the Green Sky Trilogy. If you ever want to read something interesting that's a quick read because it's for young readers, it's a fantastic series of books, the Green Sky Trilogy. So, okay. Very interesting stuff. So you uh, you have TV where you live, yes? <laughs> sort of. <laughs> sort of. Yeah, I, I stream stuff. I don't get any over the air or cable. Yeah, uh, yeah. Just because it's very, very hard to get here. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, most like, of us are doing that these days. It seems like unless you're a sports yeah. fan and you need that live TV, you know, your streaming does the trick. So, and you watch the new Stranger Things. We won't yep. give any spoilers, everyone. It's fine. We won't. Won't. And uh, did it live up to your expectations for the previous seasons? Yeah, I, I don't know what I was expecting, but um, I really enjoyed it, and I've enjoyed the earlier seasons. I think part of it is having been um, a youth in the 80s and yeah. loving the references, uh, and they get so much right, which is pretty cool. Um, and I think the kid actors are just amazing. Yeah. And they're you all take... growing up. <laughs> oh, no, right? Yeah, they were talking for the next season. They're going to have to have a gap so that everyone can be their actual ages and they don't have to try to make everyone younger for the future, for this final season that they're working on. I'm, do you have any story takeaways, like storytelling takeaways that you looked at Stranger Things and thought, they did that well. That was good. Well, the funny thing is um, uh, in the Upside Down where they have these bat things attacking and, yeah. and just the whole concept of it. It's just <laughs> sort of reminded me of the Black Veil Forest, which is in, in my books. I mean, mm -hmm. it's different, but there was yeah. you know, a similar element to it, just a sort of completely rotten kind of world mm -hmm. with monsters. Yeah. But, I thought one thing that I, I like is they're able to tear apart the characters and send their stories all in different directions, but then bring mm -hmm. them together in a natural way, in a way yeah, that it uh, makes sense. They did that really well with this season. Yeah. yeah. It's just interesting because it, not every author pulls that off. Not every writer, whether for television or for books or things, can pull off that bringing people back together. Sometimes it feels like, and they all came home because I need them in the final scene. As opposed yeah, to I, I was wondering how they were going to pull that together because they really were far apart. Yeah, yeah. yeah just I thought that was fascinating and a very clever way to, to bring it all together. And of course, if you haven't seen it yet, you'll have to watch it. Then you'll come back and know what we were talking about. So <laughs> excellent. So tell me, let me hang on for one second. There's something else I want to bring up. This is one of the anthologies, I believe, that you have written short stories for. Am I right? Yep. Yeah. Um, Sean Speakman is the editor, and mm -hmm. uh, I was actually in Unbound 1 mm -hmm. with a short story. And I have one coming out in Unbound 2, which is going to be out in the fall, I think, October. Or am I confusing that with something else? I don't know. Um, <laughs> Sorry, Sean, if you're out there. Um, the story is called, let's see if I can get this right, Samantha versus the Shadows in the Basement of the Captain Riddle House. Oh my That's God. the title of the That's story. Awesome. So, it, Yeah, it was a lot of fun, and it's something I've been wanting to play with for a while. And so this is, this is not a Green Rider story. This is something completely different, it sounds like. Um, it is, and but there is an Easter egg for people who have re read um, Winter Light. Oh, awesome. Very cool. So now, what was the theme? Was there a theme to this, or was it more just a collection of just cool ideas, or how was this sort of put together? Well, the anthology as a whole is um, what it says, unbound. Um, so it's without theme. The theme mm -hmm. is themelessness, oh, I guess. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is, you know, science fiction and fantasy, and that's about the only theme there is to it. It's to allow the authors to explore what they want, basically, which is very freeing and wonderful. So do you, uh, have you written 
science fiction? I mean, is that an, an area that you'd want to explore or is that sort of, are you, are you pretty comfortable in your fantasy space? I think I'm pretty comfortable in fantasy. I, I don't know if I would dare write science fiction. Mm -hmm. I am. Um, the idea scares me a little bit. <laughs> is it the sort of the, having fans that would be like so into the technology and to the science part of the science fiction? That's the scary part? Yeah, I think so. You know, I have a friend, Julie Ternada. I don't know if you've heard of her, but she um, she writes primarily science fiction but and is a biologist by training. Um, she's also a DAW author. But she is able to cross seamlessly over into fantasy, so I'm a little bit jealous of that. But uh, <laughs> she's, a, she's a good example of someone who can do both. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is a challenge. I mean, not many authors do that. Well, some authors do it, but not everyone does it really well, right? They don't seem to make that crossover. And it kind of is a different sort of reader when you get into those. And our, we have a writer's group and uh, some couple of the folks are hardcore sci-fi. A couple of people are hardcore fantasy. And having them read one another's stuff, it's just very interesting to sort of see how they react to one another. Things like, well, the, I just described how the hyperdrive works and the sci-fi people are going like, it's awesome, I love it. And the fantasy people are going, I just don't care. Where are they going, right? <laughs> <laughs> I imagine it's very helpful, though, to have that kind of cross-pollination. It is, actually. It's actually really helpful because having different sorts of views, all of a sudden you think to yourself, well, I guess it wouldn't really hurt for me to explore that area in my sci-fi book or in my fantasy book and sort of add some richness to it. Do you have pre-readers or a writer's group or anything that you work with to, as you're writing? I was with a writing group for many years and um, we would, you know, lose a, a couple writers and somebody new would come on, on and they weren't fantasy and science fiction people and it was really mm -hmm. hard to say, well, this is the fifth book of an epic fantasy series in which you're coming to in the middle of Mm -hmm. and and them not understanding the genre and it got a little bit tiring and i th i felt like i was at a point where it was time to separate mm -hmm. um, but i do have a, a good friend who's kind of my alpha reader and she will give me good pointers and and uh red ink me that kind of thing mm -hmm. tell you when you're going astray yep <laughs> Yeah, or if you use that word too many times, uh -huh. <laughs> that kind of thing, yeah. Be painfully honest when you have to hear it. <laughs> yep, absolutely. It's always good to have that sort of reader and feedback in your life, especially, I mean, people say, well, it's your friend. Will they be honest? I'm like, actually, my friends are more honest, too honest at times. Yeah, and she's, <laughs> fortunately, <laughs> she's, she's a writer herself and... Um, oh, that's great. Was a professional copy editor and a journalist. And so <laughs> oh, <laughs> she has some awesome. expertise. Yeah. Yeah. Even even though some of her suggestions make me sort of like bristle inside. And then, you know, I think about it and usually she's right. Now, a lot of ed folks work with an editor who's the same editor they've worked with year after year after year. Has that been true for you in your books? Yeah. Um, Green Rider was bought by Betsy Walheim of mm -hmm. uh, DAW books and she's been my editor all along. And that relationship, you know, I don't think everyone understands quite what an editor's comments and feedback looks like. And I know every editor is a little bit different, but some people imagine copy editors when they imagine editors, as opposed to the sort of feedback. What's the sort of feedback that you get from Betsy when you guys are, when she reads through your book and sends back comments to you? What does that look like in general? Okay. Well, a copy editor, for those who don't know, um, will look at your grammar and do line editing and that kind of thing. Um, Betsy, being my my main editor, um, she has served like an eagle eye view of the whole situation. And so she's not really line editing, but she's looking at the story, making sure that the story makes sense and works together so that's the best best way i can think of describing yeah. it now 
over the years, I mean, I'm sure you developed some sort of almost like a back and forth call and response sort of relationship with someone you worked with for that long. I mean, do you find it difficult to work with other other editors now, or is it interesting to see other editors in the way that they approach your work? Or well, I haven't worked with uh, too many editors, mm -hmm. um, so I I don't really hear from them <laughs> <laughs> so even with this latest short story I wrote um, Sean liked it and we went through the process of getting it ready for publication and so oh, there was awesome. there was yeah no really no back and forth or anything yeah, like that. yeah 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 so were there ever moments where your editor made you sad because you weren't they they really pushed you really pushed you not to do something you really wanted to do i've heard lo lots of stories from folks who have been like she wouldn't let me kill the baby or something like that <laughs> <laughs> well i remember i i had written the draft for my third book uh the high king's tomb mm -hmm. and um she's very sad that i did not include ghosts because uh -huh. i included ghosts in my previous books and so not only did I go back and include ghosts, I made a big deal of the ghosts. And so from that point on, all ghosts in my books are dedicated to Betsy. <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, that's great. All right, hang on. I'm just getting a ping here with a message. Oh, all right. So... You know, one of the questions is you said you were, you loved horses when you were young. Is our horse is still a big love of yours? Yeah. You know, from a distance, um, uh -huh. I, haven't, <laughs> I haven't ridden in, in many years. Um, mm -hmm. but I, but when I started writing any novel, I felt that there had to be horses just because I love them so much. And, um, one of the things that's really useful about TikTok is mm -hmm. that there's a lot of horse people on there and I love watching all the the horse TikToks. So especially the ones with foals in them. Uh-huh. So your for you page constantly brings you up some nice full videos and things as you're, yep, as you're yep. through. Beautiful horses and people's <laughs> horses and um show events. It's it's good. It it refreshes me without being actually with horses. <laughs> without having to do all the other horse stuff. That is yeah. less enjoyable. <laughs> <laughs> so you went to get, you went to Gen Con one year. You're at the Writers Symposium. Do you have many conventions? Are you are they showing up back on your schedule? Are you getting back out into the world post COVID, or are you still holding off before you you start heading out again? I'm still holding off. Um, I don't go to many conventions at all. Mm -hmm. uh, so Gen Con would be kind of was kind of a rare event for me mm -hmm. um but eventually i'll get back to to one or two um but for now i'm just i'm just being a little bit cautious yeah all right so for a lot of folks and i don't think people often understand this we i've talked to like we terry brooks and i talked about this right this whole idea that conventions can be a really exhausting experience because you're kind of putting yourself on stage for like four days straight in front of people. Do you find conventions to be invigorating, exhausting, all of the above? Well, my friend Julie, who I mentioned, uh, she mm -hmm. she finds them invigorating, but I'm such an introvert that it's, it's very difficult. Um, I also deal with some chronic illness, which is fatiguing. Mm -hmm. And so that's another reason why I don't often go out to conventions because if I do, I lose not only the travel time and the time being there, but two to four weeks recovering from it afterwards. Mm, and yeah. Uh, yeah, that's that's time that, you know, most people don't have. So I choose carefully when I go, but I do enjoy them. I um, especially like seeing friends and um, sometimes my editor will be there or, mm -hmm. or what have you. And also to uh, meet and greet the fans because when you live in your cave and you're writing in your cave, <laughs> sometimes you forget that people actually like your stuff. Uh-huh. So, oh, that's yeah. cool. Yeah, and social media will never never fill in that gap um, the way meeting people in person. Yeah, it's never quite it's, the same thing. Yeah. I mean, it's great. It's a, it's a neat way to be able to 
communicate and to touch base or connect with people in ways that you weren't able to in the past. But there's still something different about walking into a room full of people and, you know, that life energy that you get with a bunch of people together. Yeah. And it's cool. So do you have any sort of nerdy pastimes? Do you spend time uh, playing board games or looking at your uh, looking at stars through a telescope or anything like that that you participate in in your free time if you have it? Or do you just do more writing in your free time? <laughs> yeah, the writing takes up a lot of time. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's kind of a 24-7 thing. Uh, but I, I've been doing some art. And that's off and on. And I play guitar, and mm -hmm. once in a while, I'll just get wild and watch Netflix for a while. And <laughs> <Crazy>. uh, <laughs> and I do like to look at the stars. I don't have a telescope or anything, but we have very dark skies here, which is which is really nice and just beautiful, sharp skies. And uh, so when I have, take the dog out at night, it's just an opportunity to look look up and and uh, see the beauty. I mean, it's nothing like what they were showing with the, the web telescope today, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's its own beauty. And oftentimes I can hear loons on one of the ponds or um, barred owls are pretty common here um, calling out or coyotes, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting. One of the things about fantasy that a lot of people don't have real life experience of are dark skies. They don't know what it's like to be on a moonless night where there's no natural, where there's no uh, man-made light around. They don't really know what it means when you see by starlight. I'm sure that's something that you've actually experienced, either where you've lived over the years, the parks you've worked. And I'm sure that that, you know, influences as you write, because it's something that's hard for a modern person to conceive of. Yeah. And I mean, how sad for people who don't have that opportunity to to see the stars the way I can, I mm -hmm. mean, especially in winter when the, the air is so clear. Mm -hmm. um, and it does, it in fact, influences my writing and um, stars show up a lot in my, in my stories. So. Yeah. I, we were one time out in the desert out West and the, the moon was down and the clouds rolled in and we literally couldn't see our hand in front of our face. And at that moment, you understand what people who live in a non-modern society mean when they say the dark of night. I mean, they're talking, everything's just gone. It's black all around you. Yeah, it's, you know, it can be, can be frightening. It can be difficult. It can be gorgeous. Yeah. Um, it's all those things. Yeah, it's fascinating. And I think it's good to, you know, a lot of times folks the benefit of looking to life as a writer, I think is extremely important. The same way it's important for artists to look to life. You know, a lot of folks, there's the talk about comic book art where you learn to draw comics by looking at comics versus learn to draw by looking at life. And the difference that that makes in the end product, I think writing is probably the same way in terms of experiencing things firsthand. Yeah. And, um, I think that's why a lot of people advise people, young people who want to be writers to go out and experience life yeah. a little bit. And I find my park service experience, that day job as having been very important to being able to write. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, especially epic fantasy, right? Where, you know, nature and the outdoors is part of life more than it is in say, a science fiction book where you hop in your spaceship and stand in your lit dome with its solar panels and all the rest. So I guess unless you get lost in the wilderness of some distant planet, which could happen as well. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I'm not sure we didn't get to really talk about this very much. So I don't know if you've really had a time to give it some thought. So I apologize for, for doing this. If uh, you're not ready to talk about it, do you have anybody you'd like to share that, a uh, person who you've discovered or read or talked to that you think deserves a spotlight that you think folks should read about or their work or should go check them out? Well, I mentioned my friend Julie a couple yeah. times, and I really think that she would be um, a great person for people to look up if they like science fiction or fantasy. What's um, again? 
Okay, Trinata, it's C Z E R N E D A. And um, she writes science fiction with a biological point of view, uh, but what's really brilliant is her characters. And uh, so some science fiction, you know, it's, it's about the, the science, right? And, mm -hmm. and hers is about the science, but it's also about the characters and you care about them and the stories. So she actually uh, was picked up by Daw about the same time I was, mm -hmm. although her, her first book came out um, first, and we've been friends for most of that time. But I think, I think more people should get to know her work, and she has a novel coming out in November that is a science fiction that sounds very fascinating. Oh, very cool. Yeah, it's To Each This World. Is that the is that the Yes, that's, that's correct. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, and that's coming out in November. You said biological science fiction, I think you were saying. What what did you mean by that? What is sort of the... Um, well, like me, she is inspired by a lot of things um, nature-wise and from a scientific point of view. And her aliens are brilliant. Um, the settings from which her aliens come are brilliant. Mm -hmm. um, so I think from an environmental standpoint and from an alien character standpoint, and she she makes it all make sense. Oh, that's very cool. That I'll definitely have to check out her stuff. That sounds excellent. So that's Julie Cernada, I think I've Cernada, said Cernada, yep. Right. Yep. <laughs> and there's your website, and there's the book that's coming out this November, so folks can check it out. Yeah, well, maybe, you'll, maybe you'll have her on the show sometime. Oh, that would be fantastic. Yeah, yeah, I'll definitely have to keep that in mind. I apparently will be continuing to do this after Gen Con, so we'll, we'll see about that. I'm going to have right. a whole uh, lineup to fill, so... Well, thank you very much for being on the show, Kristen. I really, really appreciate it. This has been great. Um, it's been a joy having you on, and hopefully, you know, we're looking forward to the new books coming out. I'm sure everyone's going to be very excited to be like, yay, and plus even more according to the contract. <laughs> <laughs> I have to write them first, of course. Of course, That's but we'll the hard part. to do that. That's fine. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Good to talk Thanks. to you. Thanks so much, Mark. Yeah, bye-bye. Well, everyone, you've done it again. You've spent an entire hour sitting here listening to us talk about all sorts of things, about writing and crafting and nature and stars. And uh, we thank you for taking part and listening. We'll be back again next week, and we really appreciate you watching. And I will be at Gen Con in just a few weeks, so hopefully I'll be able to see some of you there. Thanks again for watching the show.